Good morning, everyone. We now will have our lesson from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 21, and I'll be reading from the message translation. Bread and fish for all. After this, Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee, which some call Tiberias. A huge crowd followed him, and attracted by the miracles they had seen him doing among the sick. When he got to the other side, he climbed the hill and he sat down, surrounded by his disciples. And it was nearly time for the feast of Passover kept annually by the Jews. But when Jesus looked out and saw that a large crowd had arrived, he said to Philip, where can we buy bread to feed these people? He said this to stretch Philip's faith. He already knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered, 200 and silver pieces wouldn't be enough to buy bread for each person to get a piece. One of the disciples, it was Andrew, brother to Simon Peter said, well, there's a little boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but that's a drop in the bucket for a crowd like this. And Jesus said, make the people sit down. There was a nice carpet of green grass in this place. They sat down, about 5,000 or plus of them, and then Jesus took the bread and having given thanks, gave it to those who were seated. He did the same with the fish and all ate as much as they wanted. When the people had eaten their full, he said to his disciples, gather the leftovers so nothing is wasted. They went to work and filled 12 large baskets with leftovers from the five barley loaves. The people realized that God was at work among them in what Jesus had just done. And they said, this is the prophet for sure. God's prophet right here in Galilee. Jesus saw that in their enthusiasm, they were about to grab him and make him king. So he slipped off and went back up the mountain to be by himself. In the evening, his disciples went down to the sea, got in the boat, and headed back across the water to Capernaum. He had grown quite dark, and Jesus had not yet returned. A huge wind blew up, churning the sea. They were maybe three or four miles out when they saw Jesus walking on the sea, quite near the boat. They were scared, senseless, but he reassured them, it's me, it's all right. Don't be afraid. So they took him on board, and in no time they reached the land, the exact spot they were headed to. And this is God's good word for God's good people. Thanks be to God. Okay, I'm gonna make a disclaimer today because we're inside and although we have air conditioning downstairs for folks who are looking out in virtual land, we're still pretty toasty inside with our fans. So I'm going to have my cup of joe up here with me just so I don't get too parched and be like. <sighs> but with all of that, you all can sit down. So I wanted to say, obviously, when you're listening to this text this morning, it's quite obvious that there are a lot of themes in this particular passage. Those that we're you know, familiar with about not being able to get rest and people showing up everywhere that Jesus goes with the disciples, about feeding the multitudes, and then Jesus slipping off again, just saying like, enough is enough, I need to get some alone time. And then you know, coming back on the boat while the disciples were out of their minds wondering where he had gone and then the storm coming up. So I could just pick a whole bunch of stuff and keep y'all here all afternoon. But I decided that I would go back to our familiar text of feeding the multitudes. Because I think in a time such as this, where we find ourselves as a nation and as a city and what we've been struggling with, it all comes down to basic needs. So feeding the multitudes seemed to be the theme that I needed to stick with. And so the title of my sermon this morning is, Can We Share Life in Community? with abundance and compassion. And it's funny because there was a prisoner that came to me this morning already talking about whether they purchase a, um, uh, a particular type of uh, bike, which at first I thought they really meant a bike, and then I realized, of course, who I was talking to, and that meant a Harley. And so then I had to say to myself, of course you can have a bike, you can have whatever you want. You've earned it, you've worked for it, you're retired, but then also, I know that this person has a very generous heart. And so it's not about the big toys or the luxurious toys or maybe the cheap toys that um, some of us have and play with. It's about what do we do in spite of that? How do we show up with generosity and hospitality like Jesus did? Because too much is given 
much as expected. And so if you're doing that piece, then your slate is clean. You don't have to worry about feeling guilty about the things that, you, that bring you pleasure as well. If you are doing those pieces that move you to compassion, to be abundant in your spirit, in your attitude, and in your deeds, correct? Okay, I didn't see a big amen with that one. Amen. Okay, thank you. I, I know y'all in virtual land were saying, yes, amen, but I just needed to hear it here. And so this week, our lectionary reading centers around a shared meal. Specifically, it centers around Jesus' multiplication of those meager loaves and those fish to feed a crowd of at least 5,000 folks. So this is the only Jesus story that appears six times across all of the four Gospels, which says something in and of itself that it shows up in each piece. Clearly, the event meant a lot to the early church and should mean a lot to the contemporary church as well. But I wonder if it might mean a lot to us as well after coming out of somewhat COVID, because we know we're not fully done because now we've got the anti-vaxxers that are making the new Delta streams and others flourish, which then is creating issues about people getting sick, dying, and even how that will impact reopening of schools and shutting down again of um, you know, the nursing homes and limits again around um, hospitals, all sorts of things. And so even though we endured what we considered to be like the worst of it, we might have to bolster ourselves for a second wave. But in the meantime, as we start to emerge out of our homes, our spaces, and get to come into the worship space and our favorite restaurants, bistros and bars and all those other kinds of things, museums, we still have to be cautious. We still have to be mindful of the other. And we also have to be reminded that this story isn't just about feeding people in their tummy, it's about the sustenance of life. As you look up here at the altar this morning and you see the elements here on the altar, that is what the feeding of the multitudes is really about. It's not just about physically feeding your body, but it's how do you have sustenance for life? How do you have sustenance to show up like a Christian and do the things that are expected of you? So we know that this story is in all the other Gospels, as I already said, but there are different interpretations of this in each gospel. And the disciples are not on any of the stories on the same page as Jesus. In Mark's version, they object completely to what their teacher is saying to them and what his desires are. In fact, this is, they go on to say that this is like a deserted place and you know, it's gotten really, really late. You know, basically there's not gonna be a lot of places open. Think about now how everything closes pretty much at 11 o'clock at night. And so maybe then it would've been like seven o'clock at night and everything was closed and they're thinking, mm, uh, we're gonna have to work pretty hard to try to come up with even something for all these people. And there's certainly not gonna be enough open to feed everybody. So, uh, you know, let's just send them away. Let them go on to their um, homes and whatever and get something for themselves. And then there's other parts where the disciples' instinct is just to scatter the people. Just, just you know, they don't even go into any explanations. Just, just send them off. Just, just tell them to go home. Let them fend for themselves. Now remember, this is the motley crew that's been hanging with Jesus, seeing all the healings, all the miraculous things, and they don't even want to work a little bit to feed the people who have shown up, who have been waiting for who knows how long, probably in hot sun like we got today. And he's just like, they're like, uh -huh. no hospitality, let's just get rid of them. Because they don't understand what their responsibility, even from hanging with the big guy, they still don't get it. That they are supposed to be in community with the folks that are showing up. But instead they're resisting the work they're resisting this um, opportunity for hospitality and seeing it as this huge burden to have to deal with. And then they have the responsibility of meeting their siblings in need who are in then community, which they're just like, I don't wanna have anything to do with that. I don't wanna have any sorts of this. But they're missing the big part 
that Jesus has been trying to teach them all along is that we need to be relational with one another. We need to be in community with one another. And Jesus drives home this point about the importance of community, relationship, and compassion for one another by his actions. He is emphasizing that who he is is God and what God wants from all of us. And further, this is what and who we are called to be. It's not just something that you're supposed to do because I said so, but this, if you're gonna live a life like me, and if you wanna hang with me and say that I'm your boy, then this is how you're supposed to show up. So maybe this is a good place for us to enter and think about after these past 18, 20 months that we're especially in a good position to not only theologically appreciate Jesus' vision, but to really put it into practice. Because as we know, we saw all sorts of things start to open up. We saw lots of different um, foundations and other places in, the, in our city, at least, try and figure out different ways to feed people to meet their basic needs, to give out vouchers for rent, to do whatever it was necessary to try and meet the basic needs of people. But we also see a different tide happening about right now, about no moratoriums anymore on rent, even though most people still haven't gotten jobs, some people still haven't gotten their unemployment that they're waiting for, all these kinds of things, but yet somehow that good feeling that before we were all in it together isn't quite being put into practice now. It sort of reminds me of like when you break a plate at home and you know it breaks and then all the shards shatter into fragments all over the place. I, th I feel like that's how we are. The isolation and sheltering in place created a lot of loneliness and physical separation. Most of us have known some form of loneliness in this past year. Our tables have been empty. Maybe there was not a whole lot of food, and maybe it's like that commercial where we see the single mom with her two little kids, and it's just broth for dinner, and then she washes the dishes and they go to bed, grateful for the broth. Or maybe it's the empty table that we weren't able to have family and friends around our tables because of COVID, because either they were no longer here with us anymore, or they were too sick to get there, or it just wasn't safe for us to have each other over and be in those close spaces, telling all those exaggerate lies and stories that we always tell at those good places and having lots of food and drink, it just wasn't possible. And then we think about, for those of us who have the sofa that someone can always come and lay on or our wonderful guest rooms that the same linen stayed on there and the only reason you washed and changed it is because you're like, nobody's been in here and now it's probably just dusty. So I need to just wash it and change it for that reason all along because we weren't having visitors over. The church, our church, wasn't locked up like a vault like so many. It was being used by our medical clinic for all sorts of people and for all sorts of reasons and we still managed to do some of our basic needs around health and food and spiritual care, but it was in a very different way. And for some people, depending upon what faith tradition you were in, you may not even have been able to receive the Eucharist for a portion of the time, meaning the Holy Meal, Holy Communion even. And so now, coming out of this somewhat, hopefully we have discovered anew how sacred and life-giving it really is to be able to gather with one another. And how much we ache when we're denied the means to be able to commune with one another, to be relational, to show up and be hospitable. Now think about how you want to break out your linen napkins and stuff and have a porch party or invite someone in for a little mocktail, cocktail kind of time. You're planning all these little kinds of things just because you want to hang out and like be with people. I know there's some folks up here who like we know they just the 18 to 20 months, they lost all their social common sense. They just don't even know how to be relational with folks, and we got to reteach them. I know this. I know. But what an opportunity that we even get to be able to try and teach them how to be hospitable, how to be relational with one another, that we actually have the possibility of doing this now. Because I think in so many urgent ways, our humanity depends on being proximate 
to one another, being close to one another, being with one another. And so on this eating together and this finding nourishment together is a huge thing and it's a basic thing. And it doesn't matter if you're wealthy or if you're poor, it's just one of those things that we all get to do together and level the playing field as it were. Now I know folks are like, well, it depends on what's on your plate. I, I hear you. But I'm saying that in this basic ritual, there is no class, no creed, no religion, no nothing. We all get to do this the same way, just like putting on your pants and your underwear. We all put it in one leg at a time, right? I mean, there is no difference. Some might be slower, some might be quicker, but we all do it the same way. And so this new original source of being together, I've heard it said that particularly in our Christian way, that we are the most eatingest kind of religion that um, exists. Because everything we tend to do revolves around food. And I know that's true at Cross. We always are looking for an opportunity to eat, to be able to commune with one another, to break bread with one another, not just at the altar, but in all those common times as well. And so indeed, I think it's true. And I know that I found myself during this pandemic, along with Vicar Heather and others that were here, that trying to run a food pantry out of the parking lot and then out of the narthex was a challenge. And having people come in and trying to find where they needed to go to get help for their health care and so forth. But I also know that it's not uncommon for what we experienced that it has, been it has been going on for a long time here. It's just that it got magnified during the pandemic. But it's nothing new for us because we've had a feeding, ministry, a feeding ministry for over 25 years. And it's grown exponentially every single year. So that tells us something. Even with having another partner, the House of Peace, literally out our back door and across the street, also having lines and tons of people. So it just sort of tells you. Then Grace Place moved to across the street this way at Running Rebels, and that was another ministry of feeding more of the elderly and other homeless. But again, just that whole idea that they had to expand from having a hot breakfast to actually having bags of food to give to people because it was about socially being connected, seeing someone that maybe you didn't get to see anybody else for the rest of the day, but also getting those basic needs met. But this pattern of sharing and benefits is shifting. We have seen all of these increases for bread, toiletries, rent, and so forth. But I've also noticed a significant increase in those who come to us more grateful, more understanding about what's been going on and still seeing them as people. But I've also noticed that during this pandemic, because of political issues on both sides of the aisle, where the poor got poor, having their means of support was cut or derailed in government systems, while the wealthy barely skipped a beat. The practical act of sharing and providing bread for the hungry has never been more important. And feeding folks, and I don't mean just physically, but feeding their souls, feeding their just very existence has never been more important. And Jesus invites us today to notice and then to act by gathering up the fragments, for it is part of the nature of broken bread that fragments, of course, will fall. Bread comes will fall. Yet at the heart of Jesus' economy, Jesus' economy, not ours, is the desire that nothing that matters that might actually feed us should be lost. Meaning that if a smile gives someone their mm for that day, then it hasn't been wasted. Instead of you walking around having some kind of attitude on your face, looking some type of way, where you could have blessed somebody simply by saying hello or doing a smile. These are the kinds of things that Jesus is saying that we waste all the time, but it's a part of feeding one another. It, he is also stating the blindly obvious of our extreme capitalism in our own context. The consumerist American culture, where we have a very cavalier attitude and action for treating abundance as disposable. One of the wealthiest countries in the world, not just by money, not just by arms, 
but even by fertile land, by the actual grains and food and the things that we produce. And how much food gets rotted because we'd rather gouge someone to have fresh fruit and organic fruit or foods and vegetables that if we can't get it, we'll pay someone to let it go bad. Only in America, while people are starving here and elsewhere. There is a sense in which the countries here in the North, and particularly us, are caught in a famine of what I would call ex excess. No matter what we eat or what we use, nothing seems to satisfy us for long. And so we continue to try and fill ourselves with stuff and things. And if X will not fill us, then we throw it away and we move on to Y. Even if we enjoy the taste of X, it doesn't sustain us or fulfill, or fulfill our needs for long. It is only possible for us to gather up these fragments that are the leftovers, and then still, often, we aren't satisfied. I'm not even sure we know anymore what truly feeds us, because we're always looking for the next best great thing. Whether it's in food, electronics, whatever you want to call it, we're always looking for the next thing, the better thing. Our culture is thrilled with its capacity to consume and generate vast wealth for the few, while we continue to push even more towards, towards bankruptcy of their spirit, of their shelter, and of their needs, the poorest of the poor. Fragments of humanity and love are seemingly being lost as we come out of this pandemic. But the bread doesn't change. Bread is always about substance. It's always made to be torn apart, to be shared, and to be broken. Bread is not picked off of trees or plants or manufactured in a plant. It is part of our cultural nexus, and therefore it acts as an artifact for us, an ancient artifact. It is then a marker of civilization and what makes us, at our core, very human. And ironically, the sacred bread of Christ is both that and part of our political economy, and yet it resists our instincts for it to be pragmatic and utilized in a way that does not serve God's needs. The Eucharistic bread, this right here, is the body of Christ. And it does not make itself available to be bought or to be sold. It is given freely. Christ is the host of the feast, of the banquet, of the table, and simply gives himself to those who come to his table. And he makes it very clear that all are welcome. Not if you got the right shoes on, or you come from the right background, or the right family, or the biggest house, or gated community. That's not what it's about. If you come to Jesus, Jesus is there for you. He is waiting. So those who consider themselves more pragmatic may be inclined to mock this very notion of understanding the practicality of participating in the Eucharist. Because they're not seeing this particular moment as an experience of celebration and abundance. They might just simply say, it's food, it's just simply bread. And um, it'll always be a limited commodity because it al there'll always be some people who are unfed and others who are with nothing. That's just the way it is. But I don't think that that's true. I think the gospel writer of John was trying to tell us something about the people attitudes, even the disciples' attitudes, that oftentimes we have people who are in mixed community, and particularly at Cross we have everything, that from every walk of life and we sit in the middle of everything, but it sort of reminds me of our progressive liberals. You know how like everything is great and they're for everything, social justicely and everything, until you ask them to show up and give money or to show up and actually do something or to maybe have a new condo complex that's really mixed income so that it is literally like, you know, 30, 30, and then 40 or whatever, you know, um, where you have the poorest of the poor, the middle class, and the extreme wealthy all living together. Mm -hmm. er, not so much, right? Don't quite want to have that going on. We don't like to practice what we talk about. We don't really want to socially mix in community when we don't feel comfortable. But the Eucharist is that concrete manifestation 
of our corporate identity of being like Christ. It is at one time that no matter where we come from or what we look like, that we're all Imago Dei, the image of God. And for some of us, it can be a real challenge in the time of John's writing of the gospel. Clearly it was a challenge for the rich and the mighty and those that considered themselves to be nobility. Because see, they had to share their food with the poor and then they had to come into contact with the very needs of seeing the difference in how they lived and showed up and how the masses were living. And then remember, what was proper protocol in Jesus' time because everybody was wearing what? Sandals. So what, what, or they were barefoot. So what was the proper protocol? Remember too that most of these folks were Jewish and even if they weren't, there was just something about what we would say was basic home training, right? Your feet had to be clean. Now, do you really think that in mixed company, the wealthy wanted to have to wash their own feet because the wealthy have servants. They wash their feet. But when you come up and show up at God and Jesus' places, not only would you have to wash your own feet, but Jesus would expect you because Jesus got down on his knees and washed the dirtiest of feet and would expect you to do the same. How do you think that went over? Probably not so well because they didn't see themselves of having to be in the same place as these folks but Jesus broke it down and said no we're all relational we're all family we're all together but they're probably thinking like oh my god why should I torture myself and have to do this shameful thing why should I have to do this and just because I said I believe in you huh but if you're anointed by the spirit if you truly are a follower of Jesus, then you understand that in this humility part of being able to wash someone's feet and then to be able to partake of the food of Jesus, to be with him, is one of the greatest gifts we can give to one another. It's that thing that when we hear about Jesus being moved to compassion, he's moved to compassion every time folks show up. But why aren't we moved to compassion when we come to the altar? We take it and, you know, I think about sometimes Do we really understand what we're doing? Or is it just, you know, routine? It's just what we're expected and we know that that's what we're supposed to do. But Jesus is encouraging those who are hungry, those who are needy, those who are weary, no matter where you show up in the class and social structure of life, to sit down together, to notice and to attend to one another, to take pleasure not only in the possibility of your own fullness, but in the fullness of the corporate body of everybody. You know, it's supposed to be like Deer District. We're supposed to be that excited, not just to win a championship because it was a long time coming, but because that's how we're supposed to be every day when we encounter one another. Where is the enthusiasm for that? You didn't make millions. I didn't make millions. But we acted like we did when we won. I had never seen so much fellowship in black, brown, yellow, red, and white, poor, in between and rich all together, sweating all over the place with one another. <laughs> Spreading COVID, getting funky together and getting happy together, right? But the whole point, when we look at Deer District and we look at that, we see that it wasn't about hoarding. It wasn't about scheming. It wasn't about conserving what I had. It wasn't about me having everything. It was about all of us together. At that point, we were all the bucks, right? We were all dear people. And we enjoyed abundance in community. To learn that in God's kingdom, there is enough. Not just enough for one, but for many. If we can remember what it's like when we're at title games, the feeling of joy and so forth, that is what Jesus offers you every day. So you should wake up exuberant every day. In here, as my one son said to me that time he was arguing with me, when I told him to sit his little butt down, and he said, okay, you know, reluctantly after like twice arguing, I'll sit down. 
but in my spirit, I'm still standing up. So that, and I was good with that. But why can't we, even in our spirit, if our bodies don't feel like it, have that exuberance that we had when we won the title, to think of that we're winning the title every day that we're given another day of life by Jesus. Again, we have to remember that even if I have enough, it's not enough for me or enough for my family or enough for my pod or for my people or my homies or my tribe or my clan if it's not enough for everybody. Because we need to be able to be moved to compassion like Jesus, to want to share the bounty that we're given with our other sibling, because if they're suffering, we're suffering. There's always more to spare. There's always more. And may we be moved to compassion for our siblings, to live out of an abundance in our attitudes, in our actions, and in our spirits, so that when we show up, we look like the title team for Jesus. Amen. Amen.